Okay, welcome everyone to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every week of the academic year at this time in this room, and this is our last meeting of winter quarter, so we will have um, a little break for the next couple of weeks, and then the full roster of spring talks is up on the, our website at vec.ucla.edu. Um, so you can go there and see what's coming up in uh, future weeks after the break. And um, I think that's all the housekeeping. So I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tom Kraft, who's coming to us from the University of Utah. And his talk is entitled, Modeling the Dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 uh, Transmission in a Small-Scale Subsistence Population. Welcome. Okay, well, um, first I just want to say a big thank you for inviting me to uh, speak here. I'm a longtime consumer of Beck Talks uh, and have had the privilege of watching many of these that are so nicely recorded and made available. I never dreamed that I would be up here actually giving one of these talks, um, so this is an amazing opportunity to uh, talk to such a wonderful uh, group of people, and um, especially to talk about some work that has consumed the better part of the last three years of my research and is a bit of a tangent from sort of my main programs in behavioral ecology, but one that I think is starting to tie in uh, nicely over time. And to get us started, I want to imagine back to March 2020, right? So the beginning of the pandemic. Um, when this was all happening, I was uh, at my field site in peninsular Malaysia doing interviews in the uh, northern highlands of the country and came back to Kuala Lumpur to basically resupply, recharge equipment, uh, and found numerous emails from the University of California saying you should start planning your trip home prematurely. Um, so we had just finished sort of the community engagement part of the project, getting communities ready for what we were going to do. Um, it was sort of a big letdown to realize that uh, we should not, in fact, be going back to these small-scale remote communities in a time where transmission could happen, especially when there were local outbreaks occurring at the time in Kuala Lumpur. And so uh, this raised the, the question, this was the first time I started to grapple with this question of, as researchers and when, in terms of people coming in from the outside, um, how exposed are these populations to a novel disease like SARS coronavirus 2? Um, and you know, fast forward, the pandemic that we are all so familiar with now, the, the, has completely reshaped our world. Um, you know, two years on, this is just looking at 2020 and 2021, uh, this recent paper from Wang et al sort of compiling data across the world, uh, estimating more than 18 million excess deaths, human lives lost to this disease, clearly reshaping the world we live in, but importantly, uh, not equally around the world with different outcomes in different places. And many people were rightfully concerned at the very beginning of the pandemic of how SARS uh, coronavirus 2 would affect particularly indigenous populations, which based on historical precedents we know have suffered disproportionately from many infectious diseases, especially those coming in from uh, the outside world, uh, having totally, totally uh, uh, awful effects. Things like, think of things like smallpox, for example, being introduced to um, small scale groups in the new world. And so the alarm was raised early on, and we started to see hints of this, places like the Navajo Nation, et cetera, where rates were skyrocketing, um, and there was very poor contact tracing, very poor access to medical resources, et cetera. Um, and academics joined this chorus. Uh, again, these are papers almost all from the very beginning of the pandemic, extensive calls for attention to be paid to indigenous populations and how they would be influenced disproportionately by COVID-19. Um, many of these are, are, were opinion pieces that were published saying, look, these are places where medical resources are limited, infrastructure is limited, um, and outcomes are likely to be worse, again, based on historical perceptions of what has happened in the world with infectious diseases. And it's notable to point out that the follow-up to this has been comparatively minimal. Lots of people were quick to say, we need to do something about this. Um, since that time, there has been still to this day relatively limited research into how indigenous populations have actually fared in terms of morbidity and mortality to COVID-19. Um, and we're just now starting to see data trickle in, places like Mexico looking, comparing indigenous and non-indigenous populations, but again, treating indigeneity as essentially a risk factor rather than the things that actually underlie increased exposure in these populations, things like social structure, access to healthcare, et cetera. And so like other anthropologists though, as, as people who have developed long-term relationships with the communities that we work in, uh, we were concerned about how the, the populations that we developed these relationships with would be affected as well by COVID-19, and more importantly, whether there was something we could do about this, right? This is early 2020. 
Um, and so at the time, I was working as a postdoc with the Chimane Health and Life History Project under Mike Gervin at UCSB. Uh, and uh, Mike Gervin, Hilly Kaplan, and other leaders of that project were extremely concerned whether there was anything we could do, seeing what was happening in the world then, places like Italy with massive outbreaks, whether we could prevent those same disastrous outcomes from occurring uh, in a population like the Chimane, shown here, um, which I'll talk about later. And in particular, you know, a group where we could leverage decades of data that have been collected, was there anything we could do that um, could actually help in this situation? Practical applied anthropology. And so in terms of mitigating COVID-19, um, there's a number of things you would, you'd want to know. Um, the first is how could you prepare communities for the disease that was, we knew was eventually going to get to lowland Bolivia? Um, and within those communities, who is most at risk? Which communities, which villages are most likely to get hit by this disease and are likely to have the worst outcomes? Given the limited medical resources we had at the time, and Hillary Kaplan worked extremely hard um, getting together PPE, oxygen concentrators, other types of actual medical uh, equipment that could be sent to Bolivia and could be used in the case of uh, catastrophic effects due to COVID-19, how would we actually distribute these limited resources throughout the Chamani community to have the most effect? And finally, um, how do we direct public health messaging to these communities to prepare them? And what do we actually say? What do you recommend people do? Again, we were already seeing how COVID-19 was reshaping the urban industrialized world that we live in. Um, what do you tell people to do uh, with that knowledge in advance? What can we actually say? And so one of the uh, key recommendations, and this was outlined in a paper in The Lancet uh, during this sort of early uh, planning phase, was to suggest that Chimani communities could, exhibit, uh, could use voluntary collective isolation as a strategy to limit the disease coming in in the first place. So these are populations that essentially produce all of the food that they need to live. Uh, they can function independently with basically without access to the outside world. And given that that is where the disease is going to originate, the idea here is that this could be used as a strategy to reduce uh, the, the impact of the disease, but also delay the speed at which it arrives and spreads throughout the Chimane population, and to buy time essentially for uh, medical resources to arrive. Now, this is essentially a population-wide quarantine strategy, right? So the word quarantine comes from quaranta giorni, right? The Italian for 40 days. It was developed in like 14th and 15th century Italy, and the idea here was that ships coming into the port of Venice, if you wait 40 days, this was thought to be enough time to dissipate the effects of infectious disease that could be brought in with the people bringing those goods, right? So this is essentially a long-term strategy that human populations have used. And it, obviously, quarantine ideas go back way further than that, um, a, lot, a strategy to uh, prevent spread. So this, raised, this whole effort of trying to plan these kind of interventions raised some key questions, which is um, some, the following. So the first is how vulnerable are populations like the Chimane? So I noticed, I, or I noted that they are relatively self-sufficient compared to many populations around the world. Um, but we don't really know how aspects of their social structure would affect and mobility would affect disease spread in the first place. This question I posed before about who is most at risk? What types of individuals, age and sex classes, for example, or people living in different communities? Which communities are, would we expect to get hit the hardest? Um, and finally, and this is the last bit that I'll, I'll cover in my talk today, this strategy that we were recommending based on essentially intuition about how things work in this system, is voluntary collective isolation likely to be successful in a uh, population with a socioecology similar to that of Chimane or other small scale indigenous groups? And if we do apply this kind of uh, public health message, how strict does that collective isolation need to be? Does it need to be just traveling and interactions with outsiders who are non-Chimane and urban town centers? Does it, or does it need to extend within the Chimane population to movement between villages that could affect these things? And all of this planning stage, basically what it made me realize is despite decades of intensive study of populations like the Chimane, we actually know very little about what drives disease transmission dynamics at the individual level within such populations. Essentially, we didn't have the answers to these key questions that you would want to know about um, in order to um, elicit some effective public health strategies. And the way that this is done in, uh, globally by epidemiologists is to use mathematical models, right? So models are a tool for guiding public health. We can use forecasting models, which are based on data on infect current infections and things like hospital usage and mortality to project forward 
or we can develop mechanistic models that actually say what are the salient features that drive disease transmission dynamics uh, over time um, if we structure a given population in one way and then we allow a simulation to proceed forward. And so this is the, you know, the famed IHME model from March 2020 looking at hospital cases. Uh, again, a forecasting model which had some spectacular failures early in the pandemic. Um, and as a reminder that, of course, models are wrong, but there are many useful things that we can learn from them. The goal is not always to just predict in the future, um, but sometimes to also figure out what individual factors, such as those questions that I was posing before, if we can build an accurate model and then tweak those, can we ask how they influence disease transmission in different types of societies? So it was fortuitous that at the time the University of Maryland was holding in sort of honor of the coronavirus pandemic that was unfolding, um, hosting a, a workshop on network epidemiology. The idea was to bring together people from different fields who have different access to different types of data, different experiences, different model building techniques, and ask, um, can we do a better job of representing disease transmission in diverse contexts? So again, to move beyond just the urban industrialized uh, outlook. And um, the question that I had, as well as a colleague of mine, Sarah Alami, co-author uh, co on this project, um, was how can anthropologists specifically contribute to this debate? We were the only anthropologists in this relatively large online conference, um, or at least as far as I know. This was something that anthropologists are basically separated from, despite the fact that these questions lie at the heart of what we do, as I will argue. And as you see, this is a network epidemiology conference. It's focused on how actual social networks structure uh, disease transmission in societies. And that's relevant because the classic epidemiological models that you're now probably all familiar with, SIR models, SEIR models, these are standard compartmental models that rely on sometimes more or less complex uh, series of differential equations where you have simple parameters, uh, rates of contact between individuals, you bend individuals into different categories of susceptible versus infectious, uh, and we project forward to see how um, different interventions might affect spread in a given population. And one of the challenges here is that a central assumption of these types of models is something called homogeneous mixing. It's simply the probability that any two individuals within the population have an equal uh, chance of interacting with each other and thus spreading disease at any time point. Right? Clearly, this is something uh, that is not going to apply well to small-scale societies, or really any society for that matter, but also relies on extremely large populations for that to be an av a valid uh, assumption. So it's, it's valid for infinitely large populations. And so, again, as anthropologists, we know that humans are extremely social animals. And on top of that, we interact across all the different uh, facets of our lives. So these are pictures from my field site in Peninsular Malaysia. Uh, these are Batek uh, hunter-gatherers. And you can see that across a wide range of activities, traveling, food processing, cooking, hunting, gathering, you name it, it is basically done socially in these populations. But those social interactions are not random. They're happening, uh, oftentimes we see things like play behavior, right? There's age homophily going on, all sorts of network features that we can see with our eyes and our ethnographic experience that are structuring these patterns of interaction. Um, and further, things like mobility. Groups like Batek are extremely mobile. Um, bilateral kin ties and things like that facilitate these kind of interactions in, in humans. Um, and these are widespread features of indigenous populations around the world. The Chimane, so this will be the focus of the rest of my talk, are no exception to this, right? And so as you can see, this is a lowland Bolivian uh, group. They live in the Amazonian region of Bolivia. Uh, they are forager horticulturalists, so they grow sweet manioc, plantain, rice, corn, and they supplement that uh, with hunting and fishing. So again, producing most of their own food, uh, but again, done socially. And there are other types of aggregation events that are important. For example, uh, chicha parties, where people drink this alcoholic, share this alcoholic uh, drink, but all of these things happening in the context of pretty patterned social interaction. And so what I'm going to argue today is that anthropologists are actually uniquely positioned to contribute to epidemiology with the types of data that epidemiologists rarely have. Um, we specifically focus on those aspects of social structure and variation in social behavior that drive transmission. And in doing so, we collect both qualitative and quantitative data on how people move, demographic structure, the kinship or friendship ties that structure who you interact with, um, as well as many aspects of social behavior more broadly. 
And those amongst us who are interested in psychology, for example, evolutionary psychologists, are also interested in the motivations and why people do those different things. And for example, how those types of behaviors may change in response to something like a disease entering a population. And so this is highly amenable to this network modeling framework, where you can actually use these data on micro-level processes to better understand or build better models of how transmission is likely to occur within a small-scale indigenous population. So for example, we know there are non-homogeneous -hom contacts. We know that these populations are made up of small groups, which are oftentimes spread across the landscape, structured into uh, separate villages, which creates something like a dispersed metapopulation, which I'll show an example of in a second. We also know that we can build in aspects of how people move around into these uh, into these models, right? Because movement is going to be central for transferring disease across the landscape. And finally, the social network structure itself. And so the framework that I ended up settling on for building the models that I'll present to you today, um, it's a stochastic network modeling technique using something called uh, temporal exponential family random graph models. So this has been developed through a recent R package by some epidemiologists at the University of Washington, as well as Emory University. Essentially, the idea here is to actually build in network structure parameterized with data, and then ask how disease spreads along those networks. And critically, this was developed in the context of studying HIV transmission, this, this package, which might at first, you might think this is radically different than COVID-19, maybe not the most applicable, but actually it shares many salient features with what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, HIV transmission is highly sensitive to host behavior and contact patterns. Sexual contacts are not homogeneous across the population, right? You need to know something about the network in order to model this um, with any benefit. And there's limited potential to ascertain complete networks. You're not going to have a sexual contact network across an entire population. So you're often dealing with limited cross-sectional snapshots of behavior. And you need to be able to then extrapolate that to um, the networks that exist. And therefore, this homogeneous mixing assumption that is so critical for these deterministic models that we use primarily for, say, urban industrialized populations, again, not going to fit the HIV case very well, nor the case that I'm going to talk about here today. So what are these, uh, these TURGMs, these Temporal Exponential Family Random Graph Models? These are statistical models of networks conditioned on data, um, similar in some ways to a logistic regression, but one in which we can take into account uh, network dependencies, things like cycles, transitivities, et cetera. They're temporal, so they are, deal with dynamic networks. So again, not just a static network that is the same across all time points, but one that evolves over time. They're individual based, similar to an agent based model. You actually know something about the underlying population that the model is built on. Um, and finally, and importantly, these models are generative. So these are statistical models, but from them we can actually simulate, um, we can simulate a series of networks that are going to reproduce in expectation our targets or st sufficient statistics that go, into, um, that go into producing the Turgan model. So what that means is essentially reproducing, say, rates of homophily or triangle formation or other things um, that we know to be true about these networks from the empirical data that was used to build the model. These are two equation models. They have both a formation and dissolution component. Um, this may look complicated, but it's really not. We're really just modeling uh, the formation of ties here at time t plus 1, a tie between i, j, as a conditional upon their either have, having been a tie at time t or having not been a tie at time t, as well as a variety of covariates, um, as you would for any statistical model. And this leads to, again, the formation and dissolution of ties over time um, that are going to stochastically evolve. And so to build the model, just to give a recap here, we're basically taking empirical data, we're generating target statistics that describe social networks in the population, and we're using that to fit an exponential family random graph model, which now represents how networks evolve in that population. And the key here is that anthropologists have access to loads of empirical data that can be used to parameterize these models in real ways. So for example, these are data that we are using here for Chimane. Um, this is from two decades of ongoing research in this population on behavior uh, and health. And so for example, we know essentially the entire population size. We have demographic structure of that population, how old people are, whether they live with kin, what households, et cetera how they're related both affinally and genetically, um, as well as where they live, not just on the landscape, but also specific GPS coordinates within villages. We also 
have information on social networks. So as you see here in the middle, um, a big part of this project was leveraging an extensive time allocation database to look at how people interact with other types of individuals over time. Do you mostly interact with people of the same age and sex class? Is it people who live nearby in your neighborhood? So we developed a creative way to treat these scan sampling data points as a way to um, estimate things like mean degree and how other types of interactions are uh, patterned in the population, essentially social network data. Um, and then finally, we have long-term mobility data on how often people visit town, so go to town for things like trade or other types of interactions, as well as how often people visit between different villages. Um, so we build, again, statistical models that look at how likely or what is the probability that a person visits another Chimane community or visits town at any given time point. So just to put that all together, we start with data on the macro population. Where do people live? How are they dispersed? We have data on the micro level social processes that structure behavioral interactions or contacts which, in which disease transmission can occur. And we have mobility, and we know how people move across the landscape. We feed those things forward to fit our statistical model of how people interact. From that, we can generate a series of networks that represent interactions in that population over time. And then eventually we can simulate disease by introducing it in the population and tracking it how it spreads over a number of iterations and then finally look at how that manifests in things like total outbreak size, what types of individuals are most vulnerable, et cetera. And so here you're seeing a map of the Chimane territory. You can see that these villages are structured along a series of roads and rivers in this area, rivers in blue, roads in yellow. Um, and so non-randomly uh, dispersed across the environment. And like a classic metapopulation here, these are, you're not going to interact with people in other communities on any given day, uh, just the community that you're in, but people do in fact move throughout the territory over time, and thus creating a population which does interact at some level. We can visualize that. You can see that villages close together have higher probabilities of travel between them. This is an abstraction um, of the villages in this study. Um, and once again, we can start picking up what the patterns are that are actually driving movement between villages over time. And as I alluded to earlier, we also know where people are located within villages. So for example, we can ask questions, does the person who live way out there, far away from the sort of core central area where houses are located within this village, does that affect your probability of becoming infected with disease? And then lastly, I'll just say that this is an SEIRD model because individuals start in a susceptible state. You haven't been exposed to the disease. There's an asymptomatic exposed state where you have the disease, but you can't yet spread it, followed by an infectious period, uh, which either transitions to a time when you recover or you could die based on um, probabilities uh, associated with your age class. And so we simulate from the model and we track these outcomes, movement between these compartments over time. There are a number of assumptions and parameters that go into this. Um, I'll lay them out here, but I'll just say that these parameters are chosen to represent our best understanding of COVID-19 as a disease. So probabilities of transmission coming from studies in similar areas of secondary attack rates, uh, how long uh, infections persist when you do get infected. We have really good data now on mortality from IFRs, which is better than using CFRs in this case. Um, and then finally, I'll just point out that we do this simulation over a five-month period. And the reason for that will become clear um, because we actually have empirical data that was collected after five months um, to actually test some of this. And I've alluded to this, but um, normally in epidemiological models like this, disease is seeded by randomly choosing some individuals uh, to infect at the beginning of the simulations. Uh, that is not the case here. So we think because the disease has to come in from exposure during, uh, to outsiders, essentially outside the Chimane territory, we don't do any artificial seeding in the population. And instead, um, we assume that during travel to town, people have the opportunity to get infected and then bring it back to their home communities. And so we simulate this as essentially a single wave of transmission that happened in the nearby market towns in Bolivia. This is actually similar to the empirical, uh, what empirical data now show. Um, but essentially, we just assume that there is some probability that when you go to town, you get infected. That trails off over time as the disease dies out locally. OK, I spent a lot of time on the methods because I'm hoping that this can serve as a model for how anthropologists can use um, their data to do something similar. But now I'm going to try and convince you that we actually learn something from it. So how can we answer these questions based on this uh, model results about how vulnerable these communities, these type of communities are, uh, using baseline parameters that replicate something like COVID-19? 
And the simple answer, the straightforward answer, um, is that these, a population with a Chimane-like socioecology is likely to be extremely vulnerable to uh, an infectious disease with these properties. So what you're seeing here, and you'll get used to these graphs, we see time on the x-axis, so this is 150 days, five months. Um, and here we have the proportion of individuals that fall into these different classes of either having disease or not. So susceptible are people who have not yet been exposed. Red are people who are actively infectious. Green are people who are exposed, not yet infectious, uh, followed by either recovered or dead. And so you'll see that as time goes on, the number of individuals who are susceptible is decreasing down towards this boundary of about 0.2, which means that so one minus that would be the cumulative incidence in the population. That means that the model is predicting essentially 80% infection rates across the whole Chimane uh, territory as a result of this. That is rapid, uncontrolled spread and essentially a state of herd immunity. The reason it dies out at that point is because there's so few hosts left to infect. We can look more detail at the spread in the population itself. So what you're seeing here is each bubble is representing a single Chimane community. And as the simulation goes on, individuals are moving between those classes of susceptible to either having had the disease uh, and um, recovering and dying, shown in dark gray here, or red when the active infections are there. And so when this loops around to time zero, what you'll see is that the main market town where people are traveling is located in this region here. We'll see that that is where most Communities close to market towns, especially big ones, are where the disease start. And it's not till later that in a chain-like fashion, we start to see the disease spread, for example, to more remote upriver communities. So you can start to get a feel intuitively from these kind of visualizations about how disease spread is actually occurring and where it's coming from. And we can also test our intuitions by looking at how disease actually is occurring within a community. So this is a, an abstraction of a single Chimane, a small single Chimane community. You're seeing families clustered into households where they're jittered um, in space a little bit, but otherwise space is representing where these households are actually located relative to one another on the landscape. Uh, and what you're going to see is at the beginning of the simulation, uh, if I can get this start, at the beginning of the simulation, um, we have individual, no one is infected. Some people are moving over time to visit other Chimani communities or going to town. You can actually see the contact networks that are being predicted from our model. And what you'll see around this time here is that an individual gets infected, turns red on their trip to town, returns to the community. And over time, you'll see how that disease is then spread specifically to their family members, as well as people living in neighboring households. Um, so geographic distance is definitely playing a strong role in um, spread over time. And then eventually you see those infected individuals visiting other Chimane communities where they have the potential to further propagate uh, the disease spread. And if I ran this to the end, you would see that uh, most of these nodes do in fact experience infection. What about these community and individual level traits? So that's at the population level, right? But who is actually getting infected and what traits make you more likely? Well, first we can see that this varies across communities. So each plot, subplot here is showing you a single Chimane community with curves now showing a cumulative incidence. So these are people who have ever been infected. And then they're ordered. The numbers on top here are showing you community size. And the color of this banner, light blue, is showing you villages that are further away from market town. And those that are dark are ones that are very close uh, to market towns. And the main thing you'll notice from this is there is variability. But actually, no communities are consistently escaping infection. There's no communities on this entire landscape, which you know, covers hundreds of kilometers, um, that are consistently not being infected. And in fact, there's very stereotypical curves that come to represent each of these communities. Smaller communities, as shown on the top, have a little bit more variability, as you would expect um, by any stochastic simulation. Likewise, um, you can see this another way, the number, the uh, proportion of individuals in a community who are, are infected. We see that smaller communities here, we have a wider distribution of outcomes by the end of the model simulations. But for the most part, what's interesting here is that there's about a 10 to 15% range over which the simulation is consistently predicting outcomes for any given community in terms of the proportion of individuals who get infected. More importantly, though, we can actually ask which individuals specifically are going to be at higher risk. And so I'm going to walk you through a series of plots, um, focus on the ones that are being highlighted here, where we're looking at essentially the hazard of infection uh, over time. 
Um, and so we have proportion uninfected on the y-axis. The proportion uninfected is obviously going down as the disease spreads. Um, and you'll see that we're then creating counterfactual uh, scenarios to investigate, for example, in that case, how distance to town is structuring your probability of being infected by a given time throughout the simulation. And so you'll note, with distance to town, there's no, there's no predictive power here for where you, your village is located. Uh, tells you nothing about the likelihood uh, that you are to be infected. These lines are essentially uh, overlapping one another. So be, living in a remote community, probably not very important. On the flip side, uh, the density, the local density of your neighborhood, if you live in a very core cluster of a town, and particularly if you live in a very large household, you'll note that the purple lines uh, you know, being further down in the proportion uninfected, those are L, uh, risk factors that elevate your probability of exposure to disease. And age and sex, while they make little difference, there are, there are some um, small insights to be gained here in terms of women having a slightly higher probability of being infected. We think this is actually reflected in the social network data that went in to build this model, um, as well as individuals in older age classes. This also went against my intuition because older people, generally we think of them as being less social, um, but in this case, they remain at, much, or at a slightly higher risk than younger people, which is obviously bad because of COVID-19's higher mortality rates associated with age. And then finally, we see that the community size um, predictions that are made from this are opposite, at least of my personal intuition, which was that living in a large community would be a greater risk factor. Instead, what we see is that a greater proportion of individuals actually end up infected in smaller communities. Um, and I think there's something I'm happy to talk about later, but I think it has to do with um, network density as a function of mean degree in these places, but topic for another time. Okay, so on to the third question about voluntary collective isolation and how important um, this is for, or how useful this may be as a strategy for combating disease spread in a population like the Chimane. So now we're moving away from the baseline model that I've described, which was essentially our best guess about how disease would spread in this single population. And we're moving to a case where we are going to tweak parameters of the simulations to ask what would happen if this intervention was applied to the population of interest. So in these graphs, what you're going to see is, again, time on the x-axis, now cumulative incidence on the y-axis. And so we see this going up towards 80%. And then we're going to see different lines. So the, the dark black line here is the baseline model that I've been talking about um, for the majority of the presentation today. And then these different colors are representing different interventions that we have imposed on the model. So red, for example, is if you increase travel to town in panel A here uh, by 50%. Purple would be reducing travel to town by 50%. And uh, blue would be reducing travel to town by 90%. That's a severe reduction, right? 90%. That would be like. 90% of people just don't travel to town anymore. Um, in panel B, it's the same thing, but we're looking at inter-village travel. The first thing for you to note about these plots is that reducing travel to town, after 150 days, you end up in the exact same place. That includes if you cut travel to town by 90%. That is an unrealistically high intervention in a population with no centralized authority or control, um, and is so again, starting to get this idea that maybe voluntary collective isolation not that effective. Likewise, inter-village travel, small effects, maybe a slight delay, maybe about a 10% decrease if you have 90% reduction in visiting other Chimane villages, um, but also probably unrealistically high. What if we put those two together? So if we combine re reductions of all travel, so both travel to town as well as travel between Chimane villages, we see that a 50% reduction in that, which is this purple line here, once again has almost no effect. So if that is, if public health messaging, you're able to cut down all travel, 50%, you essentially shouldn't expect to see any benefit at the population level in terms of uh, outbreaks. 90% does reduce things. Um, it also severely delays. You'll notice that the x-axis goes to 300 days, and so that would severely delay the time at which infections are occurring. Um, but I feel it's important to point out here that this requires not only reducing travel to town, but also reducing travel between communities, which is where people go to visit their family, visit their friends, something they've always done, and I can tell you is going to be a much more difficult public health intervention to implement in a society like Chimane compared to something like reducing town travel, where it's more easy to make uh, the case that that is where disease is being introduced from. Okay. I have presented a bunch of modeling results, right? You can 
change these parameters, you can change these outcomes. Um, why should we believe that this model is doing anything that tells us about how the world actually works and whether this would be a useful type of model to apply to other populations? Well, in the Chimane case, we're in a relatively unique position because following this same amount of time, um, there was the Chimane Health and Life History Project. Again, this was spearheaded by Paul Hooper, Hillary Kaplan, and Mike Gervin. Um, Large-scale antibody testing was carried out in this population to actually see how um, SARS coronavirus 2, how it actually impacted the people that are, um, make up this underlying model I've shown you here. So this serological testing was done in collaboration with a lab at the University of Marseille in France um, using uh, gold standard ELISA techniques to uh, analyze blood samples that were collected after the very first wave of COVID in this region. We think now that f further waves have come through, but this was done uh, right as, at the end of the, um, the first wave as it moved through this area, as it did eventually. Um, and we have about 1,200 individuals in this, uh, in this sample to draw on to test um, what actually happened in terms of COVID outcomes. So the empirical outcome, which is what's on the right, this is a seropositivity rate, what proportion of individuals were actually infected by the disease, um, is essentially the highest that has been shown anywhere in the world yet. Uh, basically, 81% of Chimane tested positive for COVID. This is adjusted for the um, specificity and sensitivity of the ELISA test that were used here. This is a massive, uncontrolled outbreak. Um, it's similar to what the model uh, predicts um, and at the population level. But of course, we can dig in a little bit deeper to see how the model is, is performing at the level of predictions, say, about things like age and sex or community. And so we do see uh, similar predictions borne out, slightly, high, um, slightly higher uh, seropositivity rates in women compared to men. Again, same as what the, uh, the model predicted, but mostly similar, as well as uh, minimal age differences. Again, in the direction the model predicts, but not, um, not really large differences um, as you might expect. But again, we can do better because we don't just have data at the population level, but we have data at the community level. So remember our underlying individual-based model here is actually made up of real Chimane communities. And so we can ask how predictions at the community level match across, um, across the empirical data. And so on the x-axis now, what you're seeing are simulation results, which is why we have error bars around them, prediction intervals, uh, as well as central tendency. And on the y-axis, you're seeing the empirical seropositivity rate of any given uh, community, but just the crude rate measured from these uh, antibody tests. The dotted line is showing you a one-to-one -one relationship. So in the perfect world, all these points fall directly on the dotted line, which is a model predicting exactly what happens in reality. The red line is a weighted regression fit to our community sample here, weighted by the, si the sample size of the empirical study. Um, and so what you'll see is that the model does OK. It's not perfect, as you would expect for any model, but it does OK. And um, earlier iterations of the model, these were negative or no relationship. Um, so there is some success here. We also see that the, the average prediction does fall very close to the one-to-one -one line here. So it's about a slope of one between the predicted and the empirical outcomes. But even more importantly, perhaps, we can learn from deviations from what the model is predicting. So one of our first questions upon seeing this is, what's going on in this community that had such a low empirical uh, rate of infection? And essentially, uh, or interestingly, this was one of the few communities where we have really good social network data that have been collected in the past. Going back to that model and looking at um, what was going on, so this was a nonlinear growth model with a random effect term for community. And what we saw is that there's the random intercept for this community here was an extreme negative outlier in terms of the value of that random intercept, which as a growth model of daily cumulative context, this suggests that people in that community actually interact less frequently than any of the other communities that we studied. The result that you might expect or predict from that would be in fact lower infection rates occurring in that community. So it may help explain this extremely low empirical seropositivity rate in that place. So this is how even more fine-grained data could be brought to bear on that question. We didn't actually build that into um, the statistical model we used here, um, but we could in the future. And then finally, um, distance from town. So one of the main predictors of this model is that being located in very remote areas will not have a protective effect on what's going on. And that's exactly what we see in the empirical data. In fact, communities that are located uh, more than 70 kilometers from the nearest market town, so that one far outlier on the right, no lower seropositivity rate. Essentially, 
people are not protected despite being 70 kilometers, multiple days trip uh, from the nearest uh, place where you can directly interact with outsiders. And again, this is probably explained by that chain-like fashion with which disease can spread along um, this meta population of Chimane villages. This is mainly the work of, of Paul Hooper, but I'll just make you aware of it because it's, it's quite an interesting associated finding. Despite an 81% infection rate in this population, mortality in the Chimane has turned out to be extremely, extremely low. And this is not due to the fact that there were amazing medical resources available to treat these infections in this region. Um, looking at uh, excess mortality across 20 years of study, as well as um, all of the deaths that occurred within the period during which that first wave of COVID hit this population, um, the Chimani Health and Life History Pro Project has basically organized verbal autops autopsies of every single death that has occurred. And there's only one that we can reliably infer in any way, shape, or form seems to be related to COVID-19 among Chimane, despite massive, massive uh, infection rates. So we would expect, based on just age alone, there should be on the order of between 30 and 50 deaths. Um, we're seeing one. Clearly, there's uh, very low rates of mortality going on. But stay tuned. That's a project being led by Paul Hooper. So to put this all together, um, I hope I've convinced you that anthropologists actually collect data consistently that are extremely relevant to what epidemiologists do, but also something that epidemiologists rarely have access to themselves because they deal with populations where they, they only have much more coarse-grained data. I hope I've also convinced you that the temporal exponential family random graph modeling approach is a viable one for building in what we know about human social networks and mobility to actually model these things in a way that looks a little bit more like reality and does away with some of the abstractions, things like homogeneous mixing. In a group like Chimane, the social structure and high mobility that we see across the population doesn't seem to confer much protection, but instead actually seems to make these types of populations extremely vulnerable to both the introduction of disease and the spread of disease once it enters the population. And that includes in villages that are very small and those that are located very far away from other urban market centers in this case. And then finally, voluntary collective isolation is unlikely to be an effective public health tool unless we are able to do it in a sort of extreme form or if we're able to leverage it to simply buy us time to get medical resources to a region. And this is something that I think we've actually had hints of for a very long time. So Francis Black's famous work from the 1970s, you know, published in Science, showing that newly contacted tribes in the Amazon essentially showed evidence in their blood of having already been exposed to all manner of diseases coming in from the outside world. Um, we knew that this was happening, and this was during a time where these groups were much more isolated than Shimane are today. Likewise, during the 1918 flu epidemic, Lisa Satinspiel and others have developed models using historical data. So these are communities in rural Canada that during the 1918 flu tried to essentially quarantine themselves completely from the outside world. This strategy failed miserably, um, and she has developed models to essentially that mirror what we've shown here, but with coarser grain data that shows some of the same patterns that ultimately drive the introduction and then spread within communities. So is it really not an effective strategy? Clearly, if you did this perfectly, um, you could, in fact, stop the introduction of the disease in the first place. But importantly here, the question is, what are you trying to gain? And so once again, uh, isolation and extreme suppression are much more likely to be effective tools for simply delaying uh, the disease progression such that you can get medical resources to a place that will be effective. We've seen countries of Japan and New Zealand do this very effectively during um, the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, we also have seen how this is playing out in places like China, which have had that extreme suppression due to the no COVID policy and then opening up over time. And once you do open up, you have an uh, immunologically naive population, uh, which is basically primed for uh, serious outbreaks unless you have now used that time to garner protection through things like vaccines or other public health measures. And this has implications more broadly, I think, for uh, long-standing debates in our field of anthropology. Some of you may be familiar, um, Kim Hill and Rob Walker uh, arguing a while back that the best way to protect uncontacted tribes or highly isolated tribes, especially in Amazonia, would be to initiate controlled contact 
with the help of health professionals, anthropologists, and others who can essentially guarantee that when those groups have a lot of contact, that they'll also simultaneously have access to medical resources such that they don't suffer disproportionately from things like viruses. Um, contrast to this, groups like Survival International have said, wait, no, this is, really, this is a really bad idea. Doing so will all but guarantee that diseases of all manners enter these populations very quickly, and it will lead to uh, cultural destruction. Both these sides are born out of good intention here. Um, but the data that I've, I've presented and this, the type of model that we've built in Shimane, I think speaks to the fact, the unlikelihood that you're going to, through isolation alone, be able to completely protect these groups. And in fact, greater attention in medical resources are probably going to be um, essential to protecting indigenous health going forward. Um, in terms of future work, there are many uh, plans that we have laid out to try and uh, build upon the work that I've, I've presented here today. The first is that um, it's unclear whether the social structure and behavioral patterns of Chimane are, in fact, a good representation of many small-scale indigenous groups around the world. We would need similar data from other anthropologists. I know people in this room have data like that. We would need other data to test this similar framework and to see um, whether similar outcomes occur. The second is that these type of this um, exponential family random graph modeling approach is not limited to disease modeling disease progression. This can be used to model the transmission of ideas or um, other uh, cultural traits and information that could follow between patterns of contact. And so we hope to build on this in the future. And finally, I'm just going to make a plug because the other place that I'm trying to uh, push this kind of research forward is a field site that I'm developing in Southeast Asia, a country of peninsular Malaysia. Um, it's called the Orang Asli Health and Life Waste Project. We have a number of local and uh, international collaborators where we hope to be collecting these similar types of data that start with embedded ethnographic field work, behavioral observation, the type, again, that many anthropologists uh, do on a daily basis, combined with biomedical screening, healthcare, and ultimately providing uh, a long-term solution for some of the healthcare needs in the communities that we work by also training local individuals um, to be involved directly in handling their medical care. Um, and so we hope to push this project forward as well by comparing some of the different social structures that you see across populations living in Peninsular Malaysia, um, where also infectious disease spread is a major health concern today. And just finally, a shameless plug that as part of this work, I uh, currently have full funding for a graduate student. Uh, so if you have any students who are interested in behavioral ecology, energetics, or health, particularly in a Southeast Asian context, please, please um, send them my way. I would love to have some members who are interested in joining our team. And then finally, I'll just have to thank my long list of collaborators who made this uh, work possible, but especially the UCSB Center for Scientific Computing, which provided what ended up being the relatively massive computing resources that were re required to run these simulations. Thank you very much. And happy to take any questions. So with COVID, right, we have respiratory illness. We know that there are other sort of interventions beyond the isolation. So I'm wondering if these models, if you're able to model like masking, for example, as a part of an intervention strategy and its effect on disease transmission, say like rates of masking when you go in and rates of transition, uh, transmission while masking on a trip to town. Yes, absolutely. Um, that is included in the paper. Uh, I admitted some of that stuff here for brevity. Um, but absolutely, because those are directly related to the parameters that go into the model. So for example, something like masking, in theory, will reduce the probability of transmission during a, a daily contact between individuals. Um, social distancing could also be built in in terms of the actual contacts that are occurring uh, is where you could target that. Um, but like you said, you could also apply that directly to wearing masks just when you go to town. So when you interact with outsiders or visit other villages, you could build all of those things absolutely, and s some of them we, we have tested. One that we haven't tested yet actually is uh, vaccinations, and particularly vaccination strategies. So in a situation like this where there's no minus 80 freezers, right, for mRNA vaccines, um, et cetera, where you distribute resources like that are, is going to be critical. You're gonna to have to make tough decisions about it. And in theory, uh, you could figure out, or we could use this type of model to figure out where you might best apply a limited number of vaccines um, to get this to work. Unfortunately, in Bolivia right now, there's massive um, 
pushback against vaccines. People don't want them. Um, and that has proved the biggest ultimate hurdle and one that I don't, the model does not have a solution for, um, but nonetheless could speak to exactly those issues you described. Yeah. Um, can you just repeat the question? Because I'm assuming it's hard. The mic doesn't reach each of the rooms, so if you give a quick summary of the question. Definitely, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the gender difference that you found both in the model and in the empirical data. That was a little bit counterintuitive for me as well. I was wondering if it maybe it's related to things like resonance patterns, um, distinctions, and all that. Yeah, good question. Okay, so the question is about um, the uh, gender disparity in infection rates between men and women and where that stems from. So. Um, Yes, so young men have very high rates of travel. Um, I, we think that basically a lot of what's going on in the model for the original introduction of disease is being driven by those individuals. Um, but when it comes to the actual social networks across, um, you know, across the population, women actually have higher rates of contact than men do. They are more circumscribed to, their, to people who live closer by and to people of the same sex. Um, but at the same time, they actually have a higher mean degree. Um, we know that from our, our nonlinear growth models, basically, from the time allocation data. And so I think that is mainly what is driving it in terms of the model. Whether that's the exact same pattern that's driving things in the real world outcomes is hard to say at this point. Um, but the fact that the difference is small but there repeatedly, I think, does speak to something probably real. Um, Clark? Yeah, I wanted to ask you uh, a little more about uh, your thoughts on the Walker and Hill papers since you mentioned that. Um, you seem to be suggesting that the model argues in favor of their recommendation, um, or at least provides one more piece of evidence that they would be right about the health benefits of forcibly contacting communities that have chosen not to be contacted. But I mean, I've always understood that to be not just about the health consequences, but about the sovereignty of the communities. Absolutely. And that they're choosing not to be contacted. And so I, I was wondering, you know, how, how I mean, this is, obviously is their paper, not yours, but, but given the result that you have, how do you weigh those things against each other, especially since you find that in this entire Chimani community, only one person appears to have died of COVID. Right. And, and that phenomenon, that latter phenomenon, is part of the reason why now there's so much resistance. It's like, look, the vaccines, why would we get vaccines for this, right? Nobody, it's not having the effect you said it was going to have, right? You said people were dying all over the world, right? But clearly we're fine. Um, yeah, so that's a valid question. And uh, balancing those things uh, in some ways is, is impossible, right? How do you balance, you know, medical, what we think is gonna be a medical outcome versus, um, you know, yeah, indigenous sovereignty. Uh, part, of, part of what's, um, causing problems too during this is that these groups are, they are being contacted, but they're being contacted mainly through legal excursions into their territory, miners, loggers, et cetera. Hence the results from Francis Black, right, in 1975, showing that many diseases were consistently making their way in, including ones, you know, that um, had come in pretty, pretty recently. Um, so yes, I think the model does, it does weigh in sort of in the favor, but it doesn't really do anything to solve the debate about whether or not how you weigh indigenous sovereignty, basically, versus health outcomes. Um, and that's actually part of why that has been omitted from, I haven't included that in the paper on this subject, is because I don't think we are in a position to make a strong statement about that, which is essentially a moral question. Um, but I do think the medical risks are very real, and in future epidemics, pandemics, et cetera, um, we should be cognizant of the fact that the, even these, these groups that we think of as being isolated or uncontacted are likely to suffer as well if a disease comes in that, say, has a really high mortality rate. Welcome. There's a question in the back. Yeah, Brian. Uh, yeah, great talk. And I, I was just wondering if you could, I, I don't know about the researcher presence right when the sort of outbreak swept through uh, or not, but I was wondering just from your own, you know, discussions of this with community members and other researchers, whether uh, you were able to see how the Chamani community itself either used existing norms of the treatment of potentially sick or infectious individuals, or if there was any kind of like behavioral 
immune system uh, response that you were able to track or learn about in the community itself, and, and maybe even further than that, what your model would suggest about the effectiveness or not of any of those behavioral changes if they do exist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if I can summarize the question, the question is essentially about um, normal behavioral changes in response to a disease coming into a population and whether we saw those kind of things playing a role in the empirical results, um, what happened. So um, this is something that we have collected data on that hasn't, for the most part, hasn't been analyzed yet. Um, but both on traditional uh, medicine, medicines as treatment, but also behavioral uh, changes, and especially at the community level. So asking, for example, what, if anything, changed in your community? Did you, did you try to isolate? Was it effective? Did people adhere to the, you know, you shouldn't travel to town, et cetera? Um, and it's widely variable across uh, the Chamonix territory, how those questions were engaged with. In terms of the, the individual behavioral responses, for example, if somebody is sick, do you leave them alone? Um, I don't know of, uh, well, so and I, I wasn't personally on the ground, so I don't have a lot of ethnographic insight into what actually occurred. Um, but for the most part, most Chimane have reported relatively minor symptoms and continuing to work and going about their daily lives because it just wasn't, it didn't have the effect of seeming like this really devastating uh, disease. So I think in this case, probably limited. Um, but nonetheless, there's some long-term work by, for example, the Hewlett's working in Central Africa on Ebola outbreak there, as well as um, a paper by McGrath um, outlining sort of indigenous responses to disease outbreaks, um, showing salient sort of uh, recurring features across human societies where people, you know, again, quarantining individuals who are sick, uh, you know, putting them sort of off in a place where, you, you know, people aren't interacting them, with them as much. So I think there are a lot of systems that probably, if you did a detailed study of that, I think you probably would in fact see that there's a lot of changes, but minimal in this case just because COVID didn't really pan out with the devastating effects that we might have expected it to. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have a, a methods kind of question. Um, because, so for the network data, you have this you know, incredible allocation database and then you had underneath that listed a whole bunch of other types of I'm assuming like cross-sectional network questionnaire kinds of data, right? And for those of us who don't have the massive time allocation <laughs> database right. over years and things like that, I'm just wondering if you looked at the um, the, the value of those other network data and whether they panned out in the model as well. Like if you were if you ran the model with without the tide allocation data and with all those other network measures, how good are they in comparison to what the people say they're doing? Because obviously, yeah. in terms of trying to replicate this kind of thing, it's a lot easier to ask people to do network questionnaires, even though they're they are time consuming, right? But they're a lot less time consuming than getting 100,000 tide allocation. Yeah, points, that's right. Which even for the people who have them, tend to be mostly on foraging data, things like that, not as right. not necessarily on social social network, other other kinds of social networks. Right. Um, you might be disappointed by this answer. Uh, the model was built basically solely using the time allocation data uh, on this, um, but I don't think that means you couldn't use uh, other types of interviews to get at this stuff. The key is getting at variability over time. Um, and so I do think repeat sampling would be critical. We've thought about, because you know, through the, um, you know, Jeremy Coster's sort of cross-cultural project, which I believe you participated in, um, there's a lot of cross-cultural network data uh, available. I think with that kind of cross-sectional data, I do think you could pull out the, so, th so take something like age or sex homophily. I do think if the questions are geared towards the types of things that do in fact lead to social context, um, I do think you could pull that out and project forward with just a little bit more uncertainty, um, same way you would with time allocation data. It's not something we did here, um, but it was sort of the original plan because we thought maybe that would be the best data we had. Um, but so anyways, I, I do think you could do it, but the key is, because the minimal requirements for this, as is done for HIV networks, is to pull out uh, basically ego sampling data on you know, how many people have you interacted with across some defined time period, who are those people, and what are the features that increase the probability or decrease the probability of, of interaction. So as long as those things are fundamentally built into those interviews, I think possible. Um, it's just not what we did here. 
that could give you retrospective data across time? I mean, ideally, you would have them at repeated points in time, but a single cross-sectional done with lots of people, you would still meet the minimal requirements of what would be needed to, um, to, to do what we've done here. Yeah. Well, I have a question about the arrival of COVID, but quickly, my question was, real, my original question was related to this. I think you just answered it as to whether you ran the simple mass action models to see whether the predicted outcomes differed. Um, Yes, this has been a topic of some discussion. The, the complexity of doing that is um, the introduction of disease. Again, normally under those conditions, you would have to just seed the disease. You wouldn't have this travel to town component. Um, and also you would have to have the built-in meta population structure for it to really be a one-to-one -one comparison. So for the most part, we, we haven't. We could easily run an SIR model uh, at the population level, taking those same contact rates uh, as well as transmission rates and things like that. Um, it's not something uh, we've done, but if you didn't build in any of that other complexity, uh, we would be almost certain to end up at something like 75% outbreak, uh, right? Be but you wouldn't have any of the heterogeneity. So all of the stuff I showed you about age, sex, which communities are more or less affected, uh, none of that, of course, would come out of a sort of regular mass action model. But we would, in fact, probably, if the disease were to just spread uncontrollably, we would expect a 75% or higher probably outbreak before herd immunity kicks in. Yeah. Did you have a second part of your question? Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Um, just as, as far as if you know how COVID arrived and which variant was the first to, to infect the population. Right, that is a good question. Given the timing of it, um, I believe this should be alpha uh, in this because this, this was basically um, the outbreak in Bolivia in this local area started around June 2020. So it's relatively early on. Um, yeah, but I, I don't believe we have confirmed that serologically. Uh, so I'm interested in the super high rate of overall infection, 80%, whether that's a sort of general property that you expect out of all small communities in which a transmission chain begins, or whether there's something specific to Chimane. And particularly, I'm interested in like whether there's a role for like Chicha in the transmission um, mm. chain. I studied the microbiome, and of course, we're very interested in the social transmission of microbes um, through Chicha. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, that's a very interesting question. Another one of the uh, interventions or, or tweaks to the model that I didn't present on today, in fact, I have a figure on it, I think the next slide, um, is on, is you, could, you can build an aggregation events. So like Chicha parties, for example, you can ask how across time, if you have these, you know, birthday parties, this was geared actually towards church, right? Every seven days, some of these communities um, hold church services. And basically, if you put a bunch of people together in the community over time, how do those aggregation events kick things off? And you can see that basically aggregation is really bad, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, over time. You can see these, these curves here are really high. There are other reasons why people aggregate besides chicha parties, of course. Um, and these things probably, they probably make a, a large uh, difference. Whether or not there's a microbiota component of this, I don't know. Um, I, really, I really don't know what role that would play. Um, some people have suggested that that could also play a protective role in some populations that have had better outcomes in terms of COVID morbidity and mortality, um, but I really don't know in this, in this population. Um, to answer your, your first question, though, about um, generally high transmission rates and where that comes from, I will just say that um, these networks are they're pretty dense. People interact with a lot of other individuals on a daily basis. We see this in the social network uh, data. And any situation where you have that and you get introduction of disease is basically going to kick things off. Um, unless you have pockets within villages of groups that are, households that are somewhat isolated, uh, really everybody is going to end up exposed. Do I need what to unmute him? Yeah, Tom, can you hear me? Yep. So thanks, Tom, for a really stimulating talk. Um, good to see you. Um, uh, my question is whether you can use this model, whether you can flip it on its head and, and use it to inform understanding of pathogen evolution in populations like this, both with regard to you know contemporary disease, but 
also, importantly, I would say, looking into the past and trying and um, get some insights into past pathogen evolution. And when, when population, when, when the global population resembles this more than it does, you know, the, the developed north, for example, right? Um, uh, and if you think about, you know, transmissibility as being the, the focal point of selection on the pathogen, and that not being equivalent to virulence, but connected to virulence, and that often it's going to be the case that greater virulence creates greater transmissibility because there's, there's higher, higher replication rates in the host, um, uh, use more damage to the host and, and, and allow for greater transmissibility. And at the same time, increased virulence, of course, decreases mobility, right? So is it is it possible to use these findings, recognizing that, you know, the Germani are different from many ancestral, you know, putative ancestral populations in lots of ways, but can you use these models to, to speculate at least, if not, you know, provide insight into, into the way that pathogens would have evolved in the past? Uh, well, I guess maybe anytime. Anytime. Unmute. Can you hear me there? Um, that's a fantastic question. I'll wait for my muting here. All right. Um, you can still hear me, right, Dan? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic question. And uh, yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it's something I hadn't actually thought about doing with this model, but it's something you certainly could because you could introduce uh, you know, mutation rate uh, for greater transmissibility or virulence um, of the pathogen. And you could look at persistence of that pathogen over time, uh, especially if you were to simulate forward uh, for more waves of disease, um, which is something you know now we're we're thinking these, there are multiple waves now arriving, for example, in shamanic communities, um, but certainly something that could be uh, could be built in and making it an explicitly evolutionary model focused on the pathogen itself. Um, I know I keep harking back to the uh, Francis Black, Black paper, but one of the actually main findings of that paper was that uh, these diseases that had been brought in from the outside were unlikely to be able to persist in those small scale populations. There was evidence serologically that they they essentially died out. They would have, they'd come in and they burn like wildfire and they die out. And so part of um, Black's hypothesis was that uh, populations in the past had social structures that in fact could not support these kind of um, ongoing epidemics. And that's certainly something that we could investigate here by also changing aspects of the underlying macro population or the micro level behavioral processes uh, within this, um, which would fit into that, uh, you know, parasite stress theory, you could really test directly uh, some of those assumptions using what we, we we think are data that reflect real world processes, like you said, as best as these populations are proxies for what people did in the past. Um, and so one of my goals actually for extending this is to use the, the HRAF time allocation database where we have what can be leveraged as social network data across this wide variety of populations in terms of how they interact. We can imagine how something about how those populations are dispersed based on you know average group sizes and things like that for FA that are included in that in that data set. Um, but I hadn't thought about including something about the pathogen evolution itself, which is a really interesting uh, suggestion and one that I I would like to explore. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes. Um, I have a, a brief question about like so. In the case of COVID, people can get reinfected, but SIR models just assume it's like you get infected and then you're completely immune, immune yeah. or dead forever. Um, so, what what's up with that? Why why do the models work for COVID when we know that people get reinfected all the time? Yeah, well, and so, of course, an SIR model is just one variant of that type of model. So you could, in fact, uh, you could, in fact, change that classification. So it's not that you're just, for example, after a certain time period, recovery could also have an expiration date on it. Um, people could become immunologically naive again, essentially. Um, so that could be built into models. But generally, we run these models on time scales where we assume people are, in fact, immune for some time after having the disease. So for example, as it's relevant here, um, an individual within a five month period, we wouldn't expect somebody to, in fact, we, we wouldn't in, in fact expect that parameter to shift back to a susceptible state for an individual. And that is the general justification that's used for that assumption across models. Um, but now as we mature sort of in terms of where the pandemic is, there's been increasing efforts to change that assumption. And there are in fact models that do what you suggest, which is to, 
um, allow future waves to happen infecting the same people multiple times. And Bob, do you expect the overall rates to be higher in the communities in those different kinds of models where they can get reinfected? Because then you can see the new outbreaks. Uh, yeah, well, absolutely. And because with each passing outbreak, a person who escaped it in the last wave may not escape it again in the, in the future. One of the questions would be, do you, would you expect the same types of individuals to be consistently escaping it? Um, one thing we see here is people who live in really small households that are really far away from the core center of their villages would consistently be unlikely to get the disease compared to others. But with an 80% infection rate, everybody is at some risk. But yes, in general, your intuition is, is right, I think. Yeah, bro. I know that you said this is Paul Hooper's project, but do you have thoughts or, or speculations about why the, um, the, the number of really symptomatic cases is so low? I mean, this is exactly, I feel like, what we're seeing in the too. It, I mean, we have, we don't have the data that you have to show that people have been infected, but people are worried about it. People, it seems like have probably been exposed and they're just not getting sick. Um, and I'm just wondering. Yeah. What you think about that. Um, so as long as, as long as it's acknowledged that I'm totally borrowing from other people's ideas here, um, these are not my own. Um, there's many, many things we think could contribute, and that's part of what makes it so confusing. Um, one is lower viral, viral loads transmitted in the outdoors. So Chimani houses, many of them um, don't have four walls. Uh, people are interacting much more often in open spaces. It's possible that the original viral loads that are being delivered are much smaller. Um, past exposure to coronaviruses, we're finding that pretty much all Chimane have a long history of being exposed to various coronaviruses. Uh, what, is, what we are completely immunologically naive to, um, there is maybe some, they may have some effective antibodies already in their blood. Um, there's a possibility that, uh, you know, the ecological conditions, so hot, humid conditions, there are papers looking at, for example, at high altitude versus low altitude, um, moisture uh, in the atmosphere, how that affects transmission that could potentially play a role. Um, I'm trying to think of the, oh, and the, and the, and the most obvious, I think, um, the first one most people go to is age structure. Obviously, this is a very young population compared to a place like Italy, um, but also comorbidities. So all the comorbidities that increase your uh, risk of mortality due to COVID-19 are, most of those are essentially absent among Shimane. Type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. People just don't have, there's not very much of that stuff. Um, Part of the work that um, Paul and Mike and others have been doing is to try and parse out, is, is the reduction in comorbidities enough on its own combined with age, just a young age structure to drive this low rate? It's not enough. Um, there's something else likely going on, um, but it's very difficult to say what exactly that is. Those are just a smattering of the ideas that have been thrown around. Yeah, but it's a, it's a really important question actually, because it's a piece of heterogeneity where we have something serious to learn from that. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you so much. Thank you very much.